Okay, let us get ourselves going again. So over the break, we're talking about with several folks about different installation problems, different bugs. You know, and it's definitely a very experimental environment. So you know, there are some things to work out, and it's almost I, I can't really generalize the rules as much as we've got to start looking at individual cases. You see now something where it's trying to convert the units from uh, like uh, SI units or from English units or very units to like metric units, and that's throwing things off. Um, in some places, it just seems to be crashy. It seems to be buggy, maybe relative to a video card problem or something like that. But if we're having troubles, like, you know, come on by and let's see if we can kind of work them out in terms of the environments. But for a lot of this stuff, I would say the software is on the experimental edge. Like, don't assume it's you. It may be it. And it's a matter of, like, uh, just kind of working to see how we can kind of fine tune it. Because it's, I think we're all learning about, like, uh, where the boundary cases are, where it breaks a little bit. But we'll get you through it, not to panic. Okay, in terms of continuing with what we're doing now, I wanted to finish up this whole issue of these windows and all the parameters just by kind of showing you a window type which is actually pretty fluid and is available to you, and you can go ahead and experiment with it. Um, it's hanging out there in the folder as there's a fixed with shelves and fins adjustable. Let me open it up and actually show you what it looks like. Because what I did was, in preparation for the class, just took that same basic concept of here we did it for the shelf and trying to make it adaptable. Let's go ahead and actually yeah, take it one step further and put fins on the side of the window. And it turns out it's a very similar operation. Your fin is very much like a shelf. It's just going to be located on the side. It's very tall as opposed to being very flat. But it's still the same basic part. And let me open this up. And all the parts that I used to create this are out there, so you can kind of take a look at it at your own leisure. And I'll go into here and kind of open up this one that has both in it. So this window, okay, which has fins on the side and a shelf on the top, and the ability to control which ones you turn on and off is a very flexible sort of element. How I created that, again, was just like what we did before. I took, started with that shelf, but then in addition to the shelf, we went through and just created a fin object. And a fin object is not all that dissimilar, but it again just has a length, a height, a width, some of those different parameters. When we bring that in, the key operation is to go ahead and lock it to pieces of the geometry where it can be locked. So I end up locking the back end of the fin. The back edge of the fin I lock to the face of the wall. Yeah. In terms of the height of the fin, I have a parameter that sets that to be the same as the height of the window. I click the base of the fin, lock it to the base of the window. And finally, the uh, depth of the fin and the thickness of the fin are parameters that I pass through so that people can keep on adjusting them. Good luck. And then with, uh, as you try to put that together into the combined object, let's take a look at it over here. Let me close up some of these. So, Here's the combined object. So the idea is that for those different parameters, what we've done is like, you know, the fin height is set, the fin thickness and the fin depth looks like I haven't adjusted. I haven't actually piped those through just yet. So if I want to adjust the fin depth, you know, the height is set to, let's see, sort of see. The height of the window. So for the fin depth and the fin thickness, if I want to make those available, I'll just go ahead and put a parameter in there, add a parameter. Oops, there I have it, and I just don't have it associated. I do. Okay, and fin thickness, let's see if I have that one in there too. Nope, that I don't have. Make that instance parameter. Okay, what's the advantage of doing that again? What that's allowing me to do is because I won't be able to adjust the subparts 
what I'm doing is making it available in the assemblies list of parameters. So now I can adjust that you know, from the assembly level. So at this point, you know, we're actually in pretty good shape. Let me load this back into the project. Okay. Oh, there's also, did I have the visibility? Let's see if I got that right. Yep, right fin, left fin. I actually have two different parameters, one to control whether a left fin should appear, one to control whether a right fin should appear. Are you stretching or you have a question? Oh, yes. <laughs> I can't tell. Oh, that would be very, very good. Hey, I like that. That's actually smart. So, okay, let's find shelf thickness. Where does shelf thickness go? Your shelf thickness even here. I don't even think I have shelf thickness in here, but we can add that in there. Okay, so a very smart move. So we come over here. Let's add a parameter in here. Okay, we'll say it's going to be shelf thickness. A fine eye for detail. Okay, so now what we'd actually like the height to be is not just height or fin height, where'd fin height go? Actually, no, it's back over here. Hang on. Oh, you're right, I could have done it on the other side. Over here, fin height here could have been height. Oh, it's interesting, it's just mapped to that. This is interesting. I'm gonna have to go ahead and do a, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a little push on this. Okay, I, I wanted to find a new formula. Okay, that's good. Okay. I actually have to define the formula in the assembly and then bring it down here, which sounds kind of strange, but you'll see that in just a second. Okay. So, what I need to do is actually create a new parameter over here. I'll call it adjusted fin height. Okay. It's going to be equal to height minus shelf thickness or whatever it was, right? Okay, so I actually had to do the computation in the assembly to kind of uh, make all the parts available because, what is it? The fin doesn't necessarily know the height of the window. It only grabs that one parameter. It doesn't have, it's not grabbing the whole... It, it can't grab and uh, transpose at the same time. So I had to set up really just as an intermediate variable for me, the suggested height. Okay, and because I've set that, now I can come back here and say that the fin height over here is the adjusted fin height. Okay. But very, very good point. That's actually, that little fit and finish is actually really uh, good. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's go ahead and now we can save that away. Let's load that into our project. Okay, what I can do here is let me grab all these, select all instances, and we'll go ahead and make it that adjusted thing wherever it went to. Adjusted. Where are you? Okay, so now it's got all those little boxes around it because it's the fins and all those sort of things working together. So now I can go through and you know, decide to, like, currently the height of the window is set by uh, that sine wave. Let's go ahead and, like, uh, adapt the script so it does the, uh, oh, maybe we'll have the shelf depth also follow the sine wave or something like that. So we'll go back to our little dynamo window. I think it's already open. So 
Currently, we're just setting the height of the window. If I want to also go through and control the uh, depth of that shelf, let me go ahead and just create another one of these. Control C, Control V. It's still going to go through and use those values. We're just going to control a different parameter. So what I'm going to do is grab this little uh, string value, kind of pop that down. And now just for the parameter that we want to control, I need to go through and make sure I'm grabbing the right name. And the right name is, was it fin depth? So I can say, let's do fin depth. Spell it right. And take it over and make that a parameter. So with any luck, it's going to do some regenerating now. This is an example of where as things get more complicated and you're regenerating a whole lot of parts, you may want to turn off automatic and just do it you know, when you actually want to test it. Because it starts to be pretty long. Oh, that was fin depth as opposed to shelf depth, but I think you'll get the idea. I'm very bad. Oh, and interesting here in terms of doing that, it looks like in terms of the fin, even the way I define that, as the depth has gotten further in there. And I don't quite have that defined quite properly yet because it looks like the center of the fins is coming in and out. So I got some, I got some patchet work to do to kind of fix this up. But in terms of the patchet work, the patching I need to do isn't in the scripting. I'd have to go back and patch my part and make it a little bit better so that it's responding properly in terms of putting all that depth on one side as opposed to being in the middle. Okay, so. so not in the middle is that one of the things uh, is going one, one direction and the other is going the other direction. Let's see. It could be. Well, one of them is going. It could be either, yeah, I shouldn't just assume because, as you guys know, whenever I assume things is in uh, 3D, oh, look at that. <laughs> That's very interesting. Okay. So it's interesting. So one of them is defined right. The other one, when I put on the other side, yes, it's just, it's, okay. Well. <laughs> I clearly meant to do that because it's a much more interesting example. Okay, so let us leave the window alone, along with some things to see off of the window, first a little bit. I want to show you just a couple of other little things to get you going that'll take us oh, beyond just sort of moving these little instance parameters. And there's a couple of concepts that are really they're very closely related. Okay, they're all about points and points on curves and subdividing things that you know, are easy to sort of get a hold of that ultimately give you a lot of power in terms of letting you generate surfaces. Okay, so let me go ahead and open up a different example. And we'll just kind of finish this up. So the other example we want to open, if you go to it's just even, let's open up. I'm going to go to out of that folder. Um, points on a curve. Okay, let's talk about this. The idea is, as we start going through and creating more and more interesting things, things that can be defined by all sorts of interesting splines and curves, it's very useful to be able to kind of grab that curve and even start to subdivide that curve so that we know different points that are evenly spaced along the curve for placing elements. It's just sort of a really useful thing. We're going to talk about sort of creating curves by having us draw them. We're going to talk about creating curves by placing points and letting the system go through and create the curve out of those things. And how ultimately you can take several different curves and loft them together to make a surface. Okay, and that's where it really starts to be very, very interesting. But it starts with this guy, which is just sort of points on a curve. And in terms of how we even got here, yeah, I just drew a curve. I'm, this is a Revit uh, part, it's a family. I can go through and just draw kind of any spline. It can be quite complicated, it can be quite simple, but that's a curve that's really defined by those four points. Okay, and within those four points, or actually five points on that curve, 
Um, we now want to go through and be able to kind of subdivide that and actually sort of select that curve, use what you've drawn manually, but be able to do some mathematical complications to figure out some intermediate points on the curve. And the cool thing is the math will follow that if you reshape the curve, you know, the math will continue to be honored. Okay, so how you do that is, let's see if I can find it over here. There's some really cool functions that let you first just select a curve that you actually have created, and then within that curve you can subdivide it by basically just saying you want to have an array of points on the curve. And what that'll do is just sort of go from the end point to the starting point and subdivide it into an even number of increments, putting reference points at all those different spots along the curve. Yeah. Once you have those points, you can do things like I can either just put geometry on the points, like put a circle at each of those different points and adjust the radius, whatever I want to do. Or I can actually put real model objects, like family instances on the points. You can really do it either way. But it sort of builds in this order. So let's just kind of experiment with that a little bit. So how that works is, if you want to get going with this one, just go ahead and open up, in this case, either the file I gave you, or it really is just a Revit family. It's like a conceptual mass family. So just new family conceptual mass it's just a mass family and once you've created that family just go ahead and say that you want to put some lines or you want to, you know, whether you want to do straight or you want to do some nice sort of spline through different points just create some little curve for yourself kind of an interesting one that's actually kind of going up in weird 3d space that other one is kind of all lying flat on the floor So, what you do now is we're going to open up a little scripting and select that line and put some points on that line. Okay, so to do that, we'll again go to our add in. And again, I'll start with the finished one and then we can kind of back off to uh, the starting point. Okay, go points on curve, go to the end one first. See if we can understand its logic. Pretty much looks like this. We're going to start by just selecting a curve. Now that means we're going to go into the document and just grab the curve, just select it, point to it. After that, we're going to go through and just do an array on the curve. And the array just really wants the curve as one of the inputs and some number of points, either kind of a number you typed in, or in this case, you could use an integer slider because I have a, you know, a finite number of points. Okay. It's going to return for us a bunch of x, y, z values. And on those x, y, z values, I could either oh, go through and just draw a circle at each of those different points, kind of have to real quickly get some feedback. Or if I want to get fancy, I could put a family at each of those different points. Some sort of object could be a desk, a chair. We will say it's like a window. Windows are the hard ones. Okay, but let's go ahead and just sort of see what it looks like. So if you want to do this with me, go back out and we'll open. I'm going to do the starting point one. Okay, which is really just, it's going to start with this notion of a curve, you know, some array on the curve and some number of points between them. So here's the way it works. When you're using this function, okay, right now I think I'm still working with that low first curve that I drew there. Let me say I'm going to change the curve. I'm going to go back over here and choose this curve instead. Okay. And now there's a different curve, there's a different ID number in there. Okay, so I've chosen a curve. And if you want to confirm that you actually have chosen a curve, let me do the little run automatically on this one. With any luck. That should be give me a curve in there. There it is. Okay, it's some curve. Okay, now what I would like to do is actually divide that, draw, or divide that curve up into a whole series of different points, x, y, z points. So I have this notion of this integer slider. Okay, so I feed it a curve, I feed it a count, and somehow out of that, if there are eight points from the start to the finish, these are the different x, y, z's along there that are uh, kind of divided evenly through there. 
back over there doesn't look all that different in terms of what's going on because this is XYZ points. It's not actually reference points that are hanging around inside the object. This is kind of geometry points. Okay, and I can start sliding up and down. In terms of understanding the Rayon curve, the important thing is the end point and the starting point actually count as two of the points. So actually, I should change that slider. The, the minimum value I should have there is really two because you know, you, you, it has to be at least two points because it at least has the end point and the starting point. Okay, once you've gone through and generated those, all those little X, Y, Z points, you can do all sorts of fun stuff to that. If, for example, I want to just put the circle on there just to give me some sense of what's going on, I could do that. Let me just type in circle. Okay, circle is just going to take a center point based on those. It also needs some sort of radius, and you can decide whether you just want to put a number in there or you want to put a slider in there. Let me give them a radius of like two. Okay, and we should have enough to actually do something, so let's take a look. Actually, it won't be there. It's still going to be in this window. Let me do the control G and see if I can zoom out and find it. There it is. Looks like an XYZ space. Uh, that radius isn't giving me very much. Let me uh, control G out there. Let me try uh, 20, see if I can see it there. There we go, that's a little bit better. Okay. So what it's done is it's just taken that curve and it's sort of divided it up into like eight different segments or something like that. And now it's in the all little radiuses. If I want to, I can sort of up that. And you'll see it'll sort of continue to subdivide or go less. Okay, or I can do all sorts of things like I can make the radius even like the slider value. So they're getting fatter or skinnier or whatever it is that's going on there. So the first thing is just can you get points to move around in space? Okay. If you can get points to move around in space, the cool thing that you can do is then use those points to actually start defining other elements. Those points could be the beginning and the end of a beam. Those points can define a roof surface. Those points can be some place where you want to put some column or some specific building element. And that's really where we're going to be going next time with this. Just to give you a sense of this, to preview that, let me uh, finish up by doing this. Oops, let me come out there. Uh, Add-ins. Yeah. Uh, come back over here. We'll finish it up with two little quickie things. One is points on the curve end. If you want to go through and have it be a specific family type, like a box or a sphere or a cone or whatever it is, super. It'll drop them on in there. Let's go ahead and run that. And what will happen is that family instance, that's actually a real object. So in this case, looks like I put a cylinder in there. It's kind of scattering them around. Again, it still sort of works that if I change the value of the slider, only four of them, expect that then, run that automatically. Come on, you, run. There we go. So useful for placing things like that. Or let me show you where we're going with this. And that is here. Let me open up where we will go. And that's the whole notion that we can go through and start defining surfaces, surfaces that are defined by curves. And to do that, what we do is the same sort of thing. I'm gonna bring open the dyno window and show you that all I have going on here is Pop it out there. Oh, 
what I've done is actually just set up a couple of x, y, z points. I have some sliders for controlling x, y, and z values for three different points. And out of those points, I combine them together and make a curve. Okay, And I do that with two different curves. So in this one, if you want to look ahead, I have one set, which is all about ultimately creating a single curve. I have a second set of three points, which creates a second curve. Okay, And then out of those two curves, I make them a list. I say loft that surface together. Okay, And that just starts to create that surface that will connect them all. And what does it actually look like? So let's kind of zoom this back out here. And I'll push that out of the way a little bit so you can see. So there we have the uh, original curve. That's the lofted surface. What happens is if I move the x values or the y values or whatever it is that I want to do, let me say run that automatically. Let's see if I can make this work. Actually, it's catching up to me. That's what it's doing here in the background. Basically, as I go through and change those values that redefine those curves, basically, the surface starts folding itself in the background and kind of reshaping itself based on the values I'm choosing. And just lofting those between those. So there's incredible power in terms of doing this. If you really want to start thinking about some incredible organic shape that has all sorts of interesting forms, and you, know, you really want to do the next big frame theory, it really is driven out things like this. It's driven out a lot of curves with parametric control. You don't want to spend the time modeling those curves individually and then going through and having to adapt them all. You really want to have the sliders and controls that let you very fluidly go ahead and keep on tweaking and just forming the shape to do exactly what you want. And from that shape, although it looks like a big old blank this canvas right now, what we're going to learn to do next time is how to actually divide that up into a series of panels so we can actually start applying structural elements or like a skin system to it that then starts having all sorts of interesting facade elements that will apply to the structure. Okay, so that's where we're going with all this. Okay, so head on out and we will uh, stick around and answer some questions. But uh, have yourself a great weekend. We're going to come up with some initial assignment just to get you sort of playing around with all this stuff. And really, it's not going to be very different than what we've shown you in class here already. So if that whole sine wave example, like kind of playing around with the parameters, yeah, if you can handle that, kind of just the whole notion of being able to kind of move parameters down and stuff like that, you're going to be in great shape. So if you want to practice on something, see if you can get that thing looking okay, on your machine. Let me go ahead and I will stop this recording and then we'll stick around and answer some questions.